these are the famous words of J. Robert Oppenheimer. Now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. The man infamously known for creating the atomic bomb. In one moment, he changed human history forever. And Oppenheimer knew what he had created, and knew the face of the world now rested on his and his colleagues' shoulders. Motivated by the pressure of total war and a possible solution to the bloodshed, he had opened Pandora's box, and he would spend the next two decades trying to close it again. Everything that you see today about World War III has been shaped by Oppenheimer. Modern conflicts will now be taken to another level due to Oppenheimer's invention. But despite this, we owe the fact that we're still alive today because of Oppenheimer's humanism and his morality. Reality. His life and the things he did are inexorably linked with the weapon he created. And whether we will survive the next decade or century in its shadow is impossible to predict. But by seeing how his unique story began and how it continues today, we might have some idea if nuclear conflict will ever come about in our lifetime. J. Robert Oppenheimer was born into an upper class New York Jewish family in 1904. His father had come from Germany and became a partner in a leading textiles firm. His mother came from a rich background, but was an incredibly talented artist. And by the time Robert was a child, his parents were multi-millionaires and he grew up surrounded by Picassos and Van Goghs. But despite their Jewish heritage, the family weren't actively religious. Instead, Robert's father believed in a new way of thinking, ethical humanism. And their teachings were that morality and good acts needed to break free from their religious connotations, and that a secular, rational way of thinking could be the basis for ethics. And it was this doctrine that his parents embodied to the fullest, encouraging Robert to explore intellectual pursuits like poetry and science. It quickly became apparent that the young Oppenheimer was extraordinarily gifted, a true polymath. At the age of nine, he was said to have told a classmate to ask me a question in Latin and I will answer you in Greek. A year later, he was beginning his studies in chemistry and physics, having skipped several grades ahead. At age 12, Oppenheimer become immersed in his hobby of mineral collecting and cataloging. He exchanged letters with other hobbyists, and was eventually invited to give a talk at the New York Mineralogical Club. It was only when Robert's father introduced him on stage that they realized they had been corresponding with a young child, and the laughter became applause once Robert delivered his speech. And so eventually once he breezed past school, Robert secured a place at Harvard, but still he didn't know what to do with his gifts. He took a mixture of different classes getting straight A's in all of them, but he eventually graduated with a bachelor's in chemistry. However, university life for Robert wasn't so simple. He was still introverted, and had little friends, although the few connections he did make were deep and intimate. And it was after that he got his degree that Robert finally figured out what he wanted to devote his great mind to, physics. The best place to be for experimental physics at the time was Cambridge, and so that's where he went. But once he got to England, Robert quickly found out that it wasn't all he'd hoped for. Whilst he had a uniquely brilliant mind, Robert struggled with the precise and laborious task involved with setting up the experiments. It was a first for Robert, who had always easily coasted to the top of the class before. And it was this change combined with bounce of existential dread that made Robert even more introverted than before. He rarely saw friends outside of very small group of confidence. He had multiple breakdowns and grew resentful of his physics professor who oversaw his failing lab work. Multiple psychiatrists and doctors couldn't help improve his mood, and he became cold and irritable at the best of times. In a final expression of his pain, Robert tainted an apple with harmful chemicals and left it on his professor's desk. And now this could be seen as attempted murder, but the fact that Robert never faced any challenges means it probably wasn't all that serious. But still, when the plot was discovered, Robert fled to Europe to see some old friends, fearing his expulsion from the college. And it was on this trip that Robert had a breakthrough. First, two papers he had written on theoretical physics at Cambridge were published, all whilst he was away, which was enough to convince the college to forego any disciplinary actions. It made it clear to Robert that his future lay in theory, not in the conduction of experiments he hated so much. And at the same time, Oppenheimer also broke through his own existential barriers, reconciling his apparent apathy for other people's suffering with his own moral ideas, making this a transformative trip. And when Robert came back, he returned a new man. The Blinkist app allows you to understand the most important things from over 5,500 non-fiction books and podcasts in just 15 minutes. With the help of Blinkist, you can discover new perspectives, broaden your horizons, have exciting conversations, and experience those aha moments. One of my favorite books I'm currently reading with Blinkist is The 5am Club, and it's taught me a bunch of maximizing my productivity through changing my morning routine. One of the newest features on Blinkist is their spaces section. The feature allows you to create a space with friends or family, where you can add, share, or recommend titles from the Blinkist Blinkist library, all in one place, just by using the app. And a space can be for a group of people or a topic like productivity or mindfulness. And all members of a shared space can access all titles in the space with or without a Blinkist premium subscription. However, I do recommend being a premium user because you can create multiple spaces with the same people or new ones. Here's how. First, you tap on the spaces icon at the bottom right corner of the screen. Second, you tap on create space. Third, you type in the name for your space. You can then tap on share and create space to immediately send an invite to whomever you like, or just tap on the create space only 
only section and send an invite later. If you select the first option, a window will open where you can select your preferred option to send an invite link to your network. And then congratulations, your space has been created and you can now tap on invite to invite more people and start sharing title recommendations. Also that you can exchange more ideas with the people that you love. So get started today and get 25% off your Blinkist annual premium subscription. Just use my link and start your seven day free trial by clicking here, blinkist.com forward slash moon. Oppenheimer finally settled into his lifelong career, theoretical physics, or more specifically, quantum mechanics. It was a new and promising field of science dominated by geniuses in the early to late 20s. Young, brilliant scientists like Heisenberg and Fermi were unlocking new secrets about the fundamental building blocks of the universe. We're talking about the time of Einstein, and all of these top physicists were studying at the University of Göttingen, and that's exactly where Robert went to finally make his name. He published seven papers during his short time in Germany, advancing the field with his unique creativity. During 1925 through to 1927, this would set the foundations of knowledge which led to computers, lasers, genetic engineering, and most crucially, atomics. After this time in Germany, Oppenheimer then moved back to the US, where he accepted a teaching position at UC Berkeley. Once a man with few friends, Robert now found himself surrounded by admirers and eager students. At first, his lectures were almost intelligible, so complex and vague that even other professors had a hard time following them. But he quickly improved his teaching, and people came from across the world to study under him. And over the 20s, Oppenheimer's mix of lectures and informal seminars made Berkeley the unofficial center of physics in the US. For a time, I acted as an alternative to Göttingen which still had its own collection of legendary scientists. But in the early 30s, when the Nazis came to power in Germany, they began a long campaign of exclusion and terror against the Jewish population. In doing so, the Nazis gutted the majority of their science, engineering, and mathematics departments. And at Göttingen, the physics department which used to lead the world pretty much ceased to exist. And the majority of scientists then fled to the West, including people like Einstein. And most of these physicists then ended up in Berkeley, often at the invitation of Oppenheimer. Along with Oppenheimer's theoretical department, experimental physics at Berkeley was also explored. And this is where things became crazy. Ernest Orlando Lawrence was Robert's colleague and close friend, and he was a genius builder, creating a machine that he called the Cyclotron in 1932, capable of firing particles at speeds high enough to split atoms, and it gave theoretical physicists like Oppenheimer the tool they needed to truly understand atomic physics. And this major development brought in many financial backers, which meant that he could create larger and more complicated cyclotrons. And the pace of research and breakthroughs increased dramatically, but so did government and corporate influence. Financial backers were mostly interested in the military applications though, and so, of course, this is where the bulk of the research went. And over the next decades, this culture of military research and technology would come to dominate Oppenheimer's pure science, using their theoretical work as a starting point. And as this went on, Robert carried on living his life. He advanced nuclear physics, found love, and even began getting involved in politics. After hearing the awful stories from his German colleagues, he developed an intense hatred of the Nazis. Like most people at the time, he had deep fears of their dominance in Europe. But above all else, he was scared that they would develop nuclear weapons. Because in 1934, a paper came out theorizing a nuclear chain reaction, a process which could cause the splitting of a large amount of atoms at once with the right trigger. Then in 1938, scientists in Germany were first to split an atom of uranium, releasing a massive amount of energy in the process. And so if you could induce a chain reaction of nuclear fission of uranium atoms, you would have a nuclear bomb. This was completely new experimental technology. And so spurred on by similar fears that the Nazis were developing this technology, in addition to a letter from Albert Einstein corroborating these fears, the US government decided to start their own project. But it wasn't until 1941 that they really got started. At first, progress was slow. The nuclear technology was so new that weaponizing it seemed almost impossible. But when Japan bombed Pearl Harbor in December of 1941 and their blitzkrieg exploded across the Pacific, things started looking dire. The Nazis had taken Europe and were outside Moscow, whilst the US and the Allies were losing more ground to Japan every single day. The US needed a secret weapon, and only their small nuclear project had the potential to make a difference. From its beginning, this was a top secret plan, codenamed the Manhattan Project, and the US government would enlist Oppenheimer to clip the top minds in nuclear physics under one roof. Gathering in California, they got to work on designing two different kinds of nuclear weapons, and the US government poured the equivalent of billions of dollars into the project. But most of it didn't go to weapons research itself. Instead, the main challenge was gathering, refining, and enriching enough uranium to make the bombs. It was an incredible industrial effort just to get the materials alone. The process was made much slower and more expensive because of the need for secrecy. If Germany learned that the Allies were spending billions on buying up the world's uranium, they would know that they were serious about nuclear weapons. So, using the British and French colonial empires, the US bought thousands of tons of uranium in secret deals from mines in Africa and Canada. Despite billions of dollars and over 10,000 people working on the industrial side of the process, Germany never really caught wind of the project. As for research, Oppenheimer called in the best physicists from around the world. Many of them were refugees fleeing from the Nazis themselves. Among them was Enrico Fermi, a physicist from Italy similar in stature to Oppenheimer. 
There was also Leah Szilard, who fled Germany and was integral to the project, Glenn Seaborg, who led the research on plutonium, and Hans Bethe, a brilliant physicist whose earlier work on similar reactions in stars was essential in making the bomb. These men and over a hundred other top physicists had a monumental task ahead of them. 1942 was mostly spent preparing the groundwork, organizing uranium shipments and building the massive facilities and reactors that were necessary for the project. It was only in December of 1942, a year after Pearl Harbor, that the Manhattan Project created the first functional nuclear reactor. It it was the first of its kind and used graphite to moderate the reaction, and it was the first real step towards a nuclear bomb. An earlier conference had confirmed that a nuclear bomb was possible, they just needed a design to create the nuclear reaction. The one that stuck was relatively simple. Working like a gun, a conventional explosive could be used to push two pieces of enriched uranium together. The energy, combined with enough enriched fuel, would cause an explosive chain reaction inside the uranium, creating a nuclear explosion. There was also a new design that involved plutonium, an element that had only been made just a few years earlier by Glenn Seaborg. Plutonium was too reactive for the gun design to work, so instead the team worked on a bomb that would compress a single core of plutonium till it reached critical levels and caused the chain reaction. These were the two designs that would eventually work, but it would take a long time for Oppenheimer's team to figure this all out. Two years of work was spent on a gun-type plutonium bomb until in 1994 they discovered it wouldn't work. Their plutonium and the way it was created always left impurities, which made the plutonium too reactive to work properly. It was only by inventing a new way of focusing the pressure from conventional explosives that the team could create a new feasible plutonium design. Once they had these two designs, the uranium gun and the plutonium compression devices, that they could actually build a bomb, and by this point it was already 1945. However, they plowed ahead, making strides in technology that would eventually lead to the first atomic test. The ethics of even making such a weapon took backstage, even as the scientists calculated how many kilotons of TNT the bomb was equivalent to. No moral questions ever slowed the progress. Even a theoretical possibility that the weapon might ignite the entire atmosphere was ignored, and every day time was ticking. Fears that Germany would eventually unleash this bomb in Europe meant that the pressure was on, and by the time the Americans in Oppenheimer learned that the Germans were nowhere near a bomb and had abandoned the project entirely, they were now only months away from their first successful test. Test. And that came on July 16, 1945, in the Trinity bomb test, when Oppenheimer and his team watched from afar as the first nuclear bomb was exploded in the New Mexico desert. Just the flash of the light from the explosion was brighter than a thousand suns. In fact, the explosion itself was so immense that it completely leveled the desert for miles around. The bomb was far more powerful than Oppenheimer or the government ever expected. And it was in this exact moment that Robert's famous words describe, Now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. This was one of the biggest turning points in human history. The world had never been the same since. Immediately after the Russia's success, came huge regrets at what they had just unleashed. On the 6th of August, 1945, according to plan, the US exploded an atomic bomb over Hiroshima, a city with a population of 350,000. After they announced the bombings of Nagasaki and Hiroshima, details about the Manhattan Project and Oppenheimer's position as director came into the public eye. Instantly, he was a household name, appearing in newspaper articles and on the front of the Times magazine. But he scarcely had time to enjoy his new fame. Oppenheimer was immediately put in charge of an interim committee to manage nuclear issues, and two years later, it was formalized as the Atomic Energy Commission, with Oppenheimer taking a leading role. It was from this government platform that Oppenheimer began pushing for non-proliferation. In an admirable but ultimately fruitless campaign, he and other scientists petitioned the US and the world to give up nuclear weapons for good. Now that they had been used, he argued there wasn't any reason to ever use them again. He saw that this would kill mankind. His invention was done to ruin his soul. Oppenheimer even took this argument directly to the president, but the meeting turned sour and Truman demanded he leave. Even though the measure would have made nuclear war an impossibility, it was never taken very seriously. For the major power, nuclear weapons were so tempting. They were the ultimate form of control, giving America power over the world. Because the US now had the ultimate leverage over their new enemies. The Soviets, on the other hand, weren't going to trust the US to give up the bomb, and so they were now carrying out their own research. And they were emerging as the only competitor to the US, and seeing as their armies had just conquered half of Europe under Stalin, many were fearful they'd swallow up the rest. And so the bomb was the solution to this problem. But but Oppenheimer knew their security wouldn't last forever. An arms race was already underway, and he was powerless to stop it. And so in 1948, Oppenheimer said that the US's monopoly was like ice melting in the sun. Less than a year later, he was proven right when the Soviets tested their own nuclear bomb. They were much quicker than the US expected, partially due to leaked secrets from the Manhattan Project. The US government, already working itself into an anti-communist frenzy, was sent into full panic mode. For the first time in centuries, the US mainland was now under direct threat, and they needed more nukes to maintain their power. And so as both the Soviets and America started growing their stockpiles, the world was then plunged into a never-ending standoff. And in retrospect, 
It may not have been a bad thing. In 1950, the Korean War broke out. The Communist North, bolstered by the experienced Chinese soldiers fresh from their own civil war, ran over the US back south. The US, the newly created United Nations, and the South barely held on. Douglas MacArthur, the general in charge of the Western forces, flirted with the idea of nuclear action. He submitted target lists of North Korean and later Chinese cities and military bases, but they went ignored. He said the US waged an entirely conventional war, even when they were beaten back from victory by the Chinese reinforcements. Eventually, the front line stabilized, which created the modern Korean border that we know today. However, what's important here is that the Korean War could have easily turned into World War III. In a lot of ways, it already was a third world war, when a united Western front fought the Chinese communist troops. But thank God it didn't spill over, and the USSR actively tried to stay out of the conflict entirely. And the reason for this was nuclear weapons. Any large conflict across multiple fronts would inevitably lead to total war, opening the door to nuclear weapons. So keeping conflicts isolated in their own regions was both in the US and USSR's interest. It was a dangerously loose solution for the looming threat of nuclear war, but we still rely on it today. And as the Cold War went on, the two Two powers nuclear stockpiles only got larger and larger. Oppenheimer, for his part, tried to interfere with the arms race. When a new type of bomb called a hydrogen bomb was theorized in 1949, he did his best to fight against its creation. Relying on fusion rather than fission, the bomb would be thousands of times more powerful than the ones dropped in Japan. It lay waste his entire cities killing millions rather than thousands. It was this bomb that threatened mass destruction on a global scale, creating the possibility of a real nuclear apocalypse, the end of humanity. So Oppenheimer argued that it was a useless weapon. It had such destructive power that it would be impractical against any target other than a city. But with Russ's recent entry into the nuclear arms race, his and his colleagues' protests were pushed aside. National security was more important, but Oppenheimer wouldn't give up easily, pushing the issue as hard as he could, even considering resigning over the issue. But it wouldn't have changed anything. His campaigning against the hydrogen bomb made him a lot of enemies, warlike generals and politicians who already despised his talk of non-proliferation. Despite their ambiguity, Oppenheimer's old political leanings would eventually end his career, because both his brother and his wife were communists at one point or another, gave his enemies and government an easy excuse to question his loyalty. The FBI were also happy to dig up any dust on Oppenheimer that was needed, passing it over to anyone who could put pressure on the president. And that's how it came to be that in 1953, President Eisenhower asked Robert to resign, but he refused, demanding a public hearing. Gores of old friends and colleagues came out to testify on his behalf, but it didn't really matter. And unfortunately for Oppenheimer, the hearing was possibly the highest profile case in the McCarthy era of communist witch hunts. The kangaroo court found him to be a security risk, mostly due to his eccentric way of speaking and some model testimony. Oppenheimer's security clearance was revoked, and he was left outside of government and the nuclear decisions, being a huge slap in the face for someone who had served his government so loyally, and in many ways it broke Oppenheimer. However, he was seen as a martyr and a hero in the scientific community, which allowed him to carry on teaching, taking Einstein's old job as a senior professor of theoretical physics at Princeton, but eventually he retreated from public appearances, becoming more private and secluded in his home in the Caribbean. And a little over a decade later, in 1967, he would peacefully pass away. And now his legacy lives on. His work to create the atomic bomb whilst advocating for peace gave the world the very tools it needed to destroy itself. And during the Cold War, it almost did. The Cuban Missile Crisis was a head length away from triggering World War III, for example. Later on, a glitch in the Soviet missile defense system nearly led to a catastrophic nuclear exchange, with human history being saved by one man who didn't pass on the false data over to his superiors. If Arkhipov made a different decision, whether he fell into peer pressure or if he simply chose a different submarine to be present on, you probably wouldn't exist and neither would the internet or probably anything else that you know. But despite all their near misses, We've survived so far today, and Oppenheimer and other scientists at the beginning of the nuclear age often spoke of humanity needing to grow up in line with our technology. In this respect, it does seem like we might have. As today, nuclear weapons have taken a backseat in the public consciousness. Compared to the peak of the Cold War, we have just under a fifth of the missiles and bombs we had then. But were we too quick to disregard the danger they pose, as there's still around 12,000 nuclear weapons in play, and it's important we discuss the situation today. Just like in the Cold War, the main two nuclear states are the US and Russia. They control the vast majority of the nuclear weapons in the world. The strategic systems, they have intercontinental range, and so they can hit anywhere on the globe. And if that was released, uh, it could destroy all major cities. Russia has just under 6,000 and the US around 5,000. The remaining 1,000 are then controlled by a small set of other world powers. China has 400, France and the UK have 300 and 200 respectively, and the rest is split between Pakistan, India, Israel, and North Korea. Of these nations, North Korea is probably the most dangerous one. Ruled with an iron fist by King Jimin, they 
they are used as a puppet state for China. And as a puppet state, they are used to do China's dirty work. And because of how much power has been centralized within King Jong-un and his inner circle, it's incredibly likely that he's got sole control of North Korea's first strike capabilities. If the Supreme Leader decided it, North Korea could use any or all of their nuclear weapons. They're also one of the most aggressive nations in the world, constantly launching missiles into the Sea of Japan to advertise their capabilities. Our Japanese leaders say they are ready to shoot down any North Korean missile that could land in their territory. In fact, the number of missile tests has dramatically increased in 2022, as they launched nearly nine times more than in 2021. And their newly developed intercontinental ballistic missiles can reach all the way to the US mainland, meaning that nobody in the world is safe from them. And recent evidence from November of 2022 points to the fact that they've started making more weapon-grade plutonium, meaning their stockpile is only getting larger. They saw a huge number, a record number of ICBMs, those very large intercontinental ballistic missiles that are designed to hit either US targets in the region, bases in Guam or Hawaii, or the United States itself. And so all of this points to a possible nuclear war stemming from North Korea as they are used as a puppet state to do China's wrongdoings. It seems like North Korea's nukes serve a purely defensive purpose. Every action that the Kim dynasty has taken has always served to secure their own grip on power. Their nuclear arsenal is no different and its insurance against any invasion meant to depose them. If they actually did start a nuclear war, it would destroy the nation. And with the US's missile defense systems, it's highly unlikely that North Korea will ever land a successful long-range shot. However, South Korea, Japan, and other countries closer to them might not be as lucky, and this is where North Korea becomes so dangerous. However, despite its repeated threats, King Jong-un really doesn't want to be the supreme leader of a nuclear wasteland. However, the worrying possibility is that King Jong-un could be forced by China, who serves as the country's bloodline, to be forced into making decisions that put a thorn in the west side. However, even with all these dictatorships, Stalin and Mao, some of the most ruthless and despicable people in history, have always had control of nuclear weapons and yet they never used them, even at the height of the Cold War. And even if King Jong-un did order their use, it's really unlikely that his subordinates would obey. They'd know the consequences of their actions, and they want to protect their own power and position rather than throwing it all away. Now, we'll never have a guarantee that North Korea won't use nuclear weapons, but it doesn't seem likely. And even if they did use their nukes, they wouldn't destroy humanity. Only Russia and the US possess the real capability to have a full-scale nuclear war between the two states. And if this happens, this would be cataclysmic. The initial exchange could kill billions, made worse by the fact that over half of the world's population are crammed into dense cities. And the survivors of these bombs would have to deal with massive levels of radiation and horrific nuclear winter. Studies on the ecological impacts alone predict that global temperatures would fall by 8 degrees. The combined effect of cold and radiation would then destroy ecosystems make farming nearly impossible for years. Famine and starvation would take over the world, possibly for years if not even decades. It's very doubtful that civilization would even survive such a blow. There would be riots everywhere. And this possible future has kept nuclear missiles in their silos, because mutually assured destruction is the only reason no one's used it yet, as it's not in anyone's interest to make this happen, especially not the people who would run it all anyway. Even just using one nuclear weapon would trigger retaliation, which would eventually result in an all-out exchange. However, recently things have got crazy. Recently the UK was accused of using uranium in their bullets in the Russia-Ukraine conflict, and on the other side, one of Putin's closest advisors, the chairman of the Council on Foreign and Defense Policy, recently stated, quote, we will have to make nuclear deterrence a convincing argument again by lowering the threshold for the use of nuclear weapons set unacceptably high. The enemy must know that we are ready to deliver a preemptive strike in retaliation for all of its current and past acts of aggression in order to prevent a slide into a global thermonuclear war. His comments represent a dangerous shift in rhetoric. For Russia's top officials to be openly debating the use of nuclear weapons is a completely new development like we've never seen before, as is Putin's recent move to cut nuclear missiles in Belarus, or like Putin's comments that the parts of Ukraine that they have invaded are now part of Russia and that they will use any weapon to defend Russia. For now, Sergei's opinion that Russia should use nukes is in the minority. Even within Russia's repressed media, other articles have come out condemning any nuclear escalation. But as the war drags on and Russia starts looking for a way out, we can't take these threats so lightly. And what precedent does this set for a future conflict like China versus Taiwan? And with the recent attempt at Wagner coup within Russia show just how much power these military leaders have in Putin's Russia, just the same as they do in America and in China. And the most warlike among them are also going to be the most aggressive in future power struggles as well. Private military companies in particular are incentivized to cross this very line. They need continuous war to make their blood money. A limited nuclear exchange and the war to follow would give them a golden opportunity. Someone's going to 
gonna profit from this disaster. And once this line is broken, it will be incredibly dangerous for everyone on planet Earth. The US has warned of cataclysmic consequences for Russia if they ever dared use nuclear weapons, but it's still up in the air whether they would actually retaliate in any kind. And if they do, then this will rapidly devolve into a nightmare scenario, one that human history has never seen before. But if they don't, then Russia will have opened a whole new Pandora's box. We could see tactical nuclear weapons finding use in wars for the rest of history if the bar does fall too low. China could obliterate Taiwan's military, or even their cities to knock off their invasion. Or North Korea as a puppet state could get the courage from China to finally invade the South using their nuclear arsenal. And it's clear that right now, in 2023, we are at a pivotal point in history, as we're currently seeing another great power struggle unfold. Nearly every single time a dominant power like the US comes under threat from a rising power, and their allies like China and Russia, war then breaks out. And we only avoided it in the Cold War because of mutually assured destruction and neither side being willing to go that far. But if we cross that final threshold and states begin using nuclear weapons, there won't be anything left to stop global war. And whilst nuclear war does seem like it's right around the corner, we're not quite there yet. Whether you can chalk this up to humanity growing up and getting more peaceful since World War II, or just our leader's self-interest, the results have been the same, and whether we can continue this long peace and honour Oppenheimer's legacy remains to be seen, but the current global crisis and the next 10-12 to 12 years will be the hardest test yet.